Welcome to Science Minds. Today I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Susan Rivera. Um, so welcome. Thank we'll you just so much. yeah, definitely. We'll just jump into things. Uh, so first off, I'd really like to hear just a little bit about your trajectory from kind of getting into science. What inspired you uh, to get involved in this field, particularly, and your kind of early trajectory. How early do you want me to start? As All early as you want to go back. <laughs> I'm not going to go back to birth. Okay. But I'll go back. How about if I go back to college? Yeah. Uh, where I started college as a first generation college student, right? And so didn't have a lot of sort of notions from my parents, at least, about what that was going to be like, but was excited to be there and thought, well, what I need from college is a good job. So I started out in the in SPIA at Indiana University, a School of Public and Environmental Affairs. I thought I might be a hospital administrator. Now, I had no passion for hospital administration, but that sounded like a good job to me, right? <laughs> so I started off in SPIA, but in the, in the meantime, I was also taking courses in psychology, and I took a course in linguistics, and I thought, now this is interesting. Um, around that time, I saw one of those flyers on a, on a wall in, in the hallway, had those little fringes on the end, you'd pull a piece off, yeah. and it was for a, a summer research opportunity program for first generation students. And I thought, what is that? And then I went, oh, that's me. So I pulled one of those tabs, and it's one of those like, that changed everything kind of moments. Yeah. And so I got into a summer research opportunity program um, for underrepresented and, and sort of first generation scholars and it got me into a research lab over that for summer after my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And it was all um, changed from that. So I got bitten by the research bug. I was sort of like, wait, let me get this straight. Like you can actually just ask questions and, and work out puzzles and you'll get paid for that. <laughs> um, so I thought that was pretty cool. And I also then realized my passion for um, psychology, particularly developmental psychology. I was really interested in child development, mm -hmm. and that's the kind of lab I found myself in. But I also had this interest in linguistics, and so I had sort of a double major mm -hmm. in those two things, and I found um, another uh, speech research lab and kind of worked in both and combined those for a master's thesis looking mm -hmm. at Infant directed speech is oh, actually cool. what it was about. So by that point, I had learned what graduate school was, because that was a phrase no one had ever talked to me about in my life prior to that. So I had to sort of figure out what people were talking about. And then I ended up being encouraged to apply to graduate school, which I did. And then I uh, ended up going to UC Berkeley, um, where I got a degree in psychology, um, and did work in sort of straight on, like kind of traditional developmental psychology, yeah. uh, which I really enjoyed. But I realized towards the end of my graduate time um, at Berkeley that the questions I was most, most interested in were questions about the brain. Mm -hmm. So I thought, hmm, I kind of want to pivot a little bit. So as a postdoc, I looked for postdocs where I could do neuroscience work and sort of turned myself into a neuroscientist. Um, so I like to tell people I'm a developmentalist in neuroscientist clothing. Um, so I learned about the brain, I learned about brain imaging, how to do that, and I did that mainly at Stanford University with Alan Reese. And um, that was really um, a pivotal point in my training too, um, because that then made me uh, sort of put another tool in my toolbox. I had my traditional methods and then I had these neuroscience methods as well. Um, and from there, you know, from that postdoc then I went on the job market and I actually ended up UC Davis, yeah. uh, where I spent almost all of my career up until just very recently right. um, as a first an assistant professor, then associate, then full professor. And I ended up, um, I was chair right before I left mm -hmm. UC Davis of the psychology department. Yeah. Well, what about, where, does, where do um, neurodevelopmental disabilities sort of fit into that trajectory? Yeah, that's a great question. So it was really when I was working at Stanford, and a little bit, I took a short postdoc right before that at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center okay. um, with Adele Diamond, and, and I started working in um, PKU, phenylketonuria there, and then at Stanford, the lab that I worked in, 
that's where they were doing research in Fragile X yeah. and autism, a little bit of Williams syndrome. So that's really where I started to learn about that. And that became part of my portfolio, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, so that when it was time for me to go on the job market, um, the Mind Institute was a place I really had my eye on. Yeah. Um, so when I applied for a job actually in psychology at UC Davis, the Mind Institute was also recruiting at that time. It was very young. The, this building wasn't a uh, it didn't exist yet, yeah. <laughs> um, and but but people like Randy Hagerman had already been recruited here and was already here, yeah. um, and so that just made me like sort of perfectly positioned to apply for that position. Mm -hmm. And the Mind Institute actually put up my startup funds, and my position was in psychology, and so that built a bridge between Psych and the Mind Institute, and that's really where I started. It was really as a postdoc that mm -hmm. I started in that trajectory, and of course that's been a part of my uh, research in addition to looking at typical development. Ne yeah. Neuro um, divergence has been a part of my portfolio since then. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, you mentioned you know you were you were the chair of the psychology department at UC Davis. Now you're the the dean at uh, University of Maryland, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really interested to hear where this kind of leadership these leadership yeah. skills have like developed have sort of fit into your trajectory. Um, I'm just I'm really interested about like what kind of itch that leadership, those leadership skills and those leadership roles scratch yeah. for you particularly or yeah. kind of more generally in, in science because it seems to me like having leadership over academics, yeah. I, I don't have a, like a great analogy for that but it seems like it could be kind of like hurting cats sometimes. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of interested about like how that looks That's for you. That's a perfect and analogy. <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> to sort of answer the different parts of your question, I, you know, I was very happily ensconced in my research lab and had you know a number of grants running and things like that when even when I became chair of the psychology department mm -hmm. and I was really thought of it at that point of uh, something that I was willing to do I really loved my department I was kind of taking one for the team yeah. you know really thought that I could be effective in that role um, but I didn't really intend to stay in a leadership role at that point but over the five years that I did that I really started to realized that that was actually something I enjoyed. Uh -huh. I was sort of like, what's happening? Um, and I liked not only, I had spent a long career, at about 20 years at that point, you know, thinking about building my own research portfolio, training my graduate students and other trainees, and really thinking about building up this research um, sort of program of research. Yeah. And I hadn't thought much about this other path. Mm -hmm. um, but being chair made me realize that one of the things I enjoyed most was sort of elevating other people around me and sort of, um, I liked solving people's puzzles. I thought maybe at first I would get annoyed if people are like complaining about things, right? <laughs> but instead I was able to sort of like enjoy that piece and think, oh, you have something you're fearful about or there's a problem that you need help with. And I actually am in a position to help you with that. And I, and I realized I like, liked that much more than I expected I would. Mm -hmm. So when it was time for me to sort of move on and, and think about just tucking myself back into my lab, I was supposed to go on sabbatical, um, I realized that there was just a little um, kind of spark of joy that was missing. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought, what is that? So I really started to like soul search about it. And I realized I was going to miss that leadership piece. I was going to miss that. Um, and so then some opportunities came along, including the Maryland one. Mm -hmm. uh, for And I'm, I'm dean of the um, Behavioral and Social Sciences, uh, BSOS, as it's called in Maryland. Um, and that opportunity I kind of just didn't look at. The, the recruiter pinged me a few times before I you know, turned my direct, uh, attention in that direction. And yeah. It ended up being something that I got really excited about. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a level of, like in a position like a dean, and it's pretty early on still, but do you feel like there's a level of sacrifice that you have to make to your science? Right, that's a great question. Yeah, and I am only a hot four months into yeah. being a dean, but, <laughs> um, but there definitely, at least for me, is some, some you know, sh pivoting or shifting that has to go on there. I mean, no, my, my research lab actually is still running here yeah. in Davis. Yeah. Um, and as I finish up a couple of grants, and I have a lab that's being, um, you know, sort of getting ready for me at Maryland. Yeah. So I still will have that. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a, a shift in emphasis and a pivot, I think, in order to be able to do the job well. I can't mm -hmm. keep the intensity in both places. I also think, though, that it's good for an administrator to have, not only have had that experience, but to sort of keep a foot in the 
the discipline, yeah. right? And so that you're still an academic, you still think like an academic. I think that helps me be a better leader mm -hmm. of a college where I've got 10 departments that I'm you know, helping <laughs> them get where they want to be as well. So I never get, give myself the chance to forget what it's like to be in that position of mm -hmm. trying to get the grants and trying to teach the students and, and things like that. So For sure. uh, pivot, yes, but moving completely out, no. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome, and I'd like to kind of now pivot to the, your, the work that you do. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm very interested. There's obviously some really cool overlap with your lab and the lab that I work in, and you know, thinking about, you know, how do we measure these like processes internally, and you know, imaging and psychophysiology, um, and the work that you do is so is just so interesting. And I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot in the context of my own work. But then, you know, reading some of the, you know, the articles that you've sent and some of the work that you do, I'm really interested in sort of where you view sort of the ceiling or limitations of the technology for people with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, you know, I think so much of this stuff is designed for typically developing people, um, and we can answer a lot of questions about typical development. Um, uh, obviously there's a ceiling there too, but I'm wondering what kind of limitations you see or challenges you feel like you face with your particular methodology, eye tracking, EEGs, right, right. MRIs. I, I'm glad you're asking this question, Angie. So, um, and, and by, yeah, technology, just, just to confirm, I think you just have, you, you're talking about the, the methodologies we methodology, use, not, not yeah. like technology that's used for, for <laughs> therapy or something right, like right, that. Right, right, right. Right, so methodologies that I use, as you well know, um, infrared eye tracking and um, EEG or ERP, um, magnetic resonance imaging, both mm -hmm. functional and structural. And there are definite limitations. Um, there's limitations that um, you know exist either for studying neurodivergence or neurotypicality. Um, but I think what is I think what's important for me about my sort of where, how I got where I am is I didn't start out as a as a neuroimager, right? I started out as a develop like sort of dyed in the wool developmental psychologist. Mm -hmm. So. I've always been very purposeful about having, um, taking out the tool out of the toolbox that makes sense for the question. Yeah. And so many times the tool that makes sense for the question is sitting across a table from that person or child or adult and, and, and using good old fashioned neuropsychology yeah. <laughs> techniques or interview uh -huh. techniques or um, physical materials and that's going to tell you what you need to know. So where I think we have to be careful and really uh, purposeful and mindful as, as people using these techniques is where it doesn't make sense to do them. It's very stressful to do EEGs and MRIs on anyone, yeah. much less someone who has a neurodivergent pro profile. Mm -hmm. So let's take out the tool that'll answer most parsimoniously yeah. <laughs> the question we want to ask. And that is really a task that I've tried to put towards myself and anybody that I train in my lab. Um, is that really the most parsimonious tool, right? Yeah. So if you want to ask a question about someone's skill set, it's going to be really unusual that a neuroimaging or a, even a psychophysical tool is going to be the right one for that. If you want to find out what's going on in the brain, what's activating, what, um, what kind of connectivity there is, then you need that tool, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a toolbox, you take out the one that will most easily get the job done. You're not yeah. going to take out a hammer to screw in a screw, <laughs> right? You need sure. a screwdriver for that. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to take the electric screwdriver <laughs> when it's just, you know, a very small one, then sure. that, that the non-electric one will work better, right? Yeah. To, to keep that uh, <laughs> analogy going yeah, too long. Um, um, so that that's where I find the limitations are, is um, making sure that we're not um, sort of over-engineering our experiments, but also making sure that we're not overplaying what that data can tell us, right? Yeah. And so if we find out at the end of a neuroimaging study that, oh, look, the brain activates differently um, when this person uh, is doing this than when we're doing that. Um, we already knew that they had a difference, a behavioral difference. Mm -hmm. So where did we think that difference was coming from? Sort of like, of course the brain will look different, yeah. <laughs> right? We've seen that in behavior. So we always, I always try to check ourselves like, 
are we asking a question with a fancy tool that we could have asked that was much more parsimonious both for us and for them? Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a really great answer. And it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to just reflect on that always, right? Because right. those new shiny things are yeah. really enticing. And it's easy to get excited about mm -hmm. that, right? Like, I think I could do that in the scanner, right. but should I, <laughs> right. right? Right. Well, on that kind of same plane in terms of new shiny things, are there new technologies or methodologies that are emerging that you would be excited about using or thinking about incorporating in the work that you do? Well, there's a, there's a technology that I've never, I, I've sort of dabbled in, like, you know, I've had ones like dropped off at the lab to play around with, but mm -hmm. um, like FNIRs, you know, so, so there's certain things where, um, which is functional near infrared spectroscopy. So um, that's usually essentially using light and the reflection of light bouncing off um, to figure out where blood flow is happening. So it's kind of like a mini MRI, but you don't have to put someone in the scanner. Um, that's something that I think can, can be one of those tools in a toolbox. Then there's been a few questions along my career that will be like, it would have been nice to have that uh -huh. tool, um, but you can't have all the toys, you can't have all the tools. <laughs> sure. uh, so maybe that one day I think, um, you know, I could imagine questions that that would be the most, most parsimonious tool to ask, particularly if you're not interested necessarily in localization, but just generally how, um, you know, sort of lateralization or other questions like that about, about brains and you have a particular population or a setup where it doesn't make sense to put them in an MRI scanner. Right. Um, other than that, I'm sure there's lots of new technology. In terms of, of other technology that's not an instrument, um, we're dabbling in some of this and some of the work in my lab, but I think people are going way beyond even where I have gone so far, which is machine learning and things like that. So, so those yeah. kinds of um, sort of methodological techniques for data analytics, I think are coming so far. Um, right. Even it's actually getting ahead of us a little bit. <laughs> so um, we're yeah. using, you see AI being used sort of everywhere. Um, and some places, you know, just as we were talking about before, you're like, I'm not sure you needed machine learning to <laughs> answer that question. But in some cases, I think it'll help us answer questions that, you know, we wouldn't have even dreamed of answering yeah. 10 years ago. For so sure. I think that's an exciting new place to watch. That is cool. If somebody were to come to your office and overnight double your grant funding, what would you do with that money? Ooh, gosh. You should have prepped me for that question. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should have. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that um, one of the hardest things is just having enough money to pay trainees to, to you know, so I think I would staff up a lab and you know some of the work that I'm doing with the person you work with who's David mm -hmm. Hessel is is work that we've been doing for gosh 15 years or so where we're following men with the fragile X permutation over longitudinally over time if I could you know we're sort of at the tail end of that last um, sort of cycle of fin funding we're hoping to get more <laughs> but if we could beef that up we could take that in other directions like looking at We've so far we've just been looking at men with a permutation. We want to add women with a permutation. Looking at the prodrome of this disease, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome, and I think that is somewhere where we constantly feel. Ah, most researchers feel this about their work, but constantly feel a bit under resourced. Mm -hmm. That we could do more yeah. if we only had more um, more hands on deck, yeah. um, and and more money for travel, more money to bring people in and and see them even more regularly, that kind of thing. So I would probably dream up new and more sort of um, robust ways of continuing that work. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's it, was been a, a, it was really fun. Yeah, it's been really nice to chat with you. Yeah. And um, best of luck in your continuing on in your new thank position. You. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Great absolutely. to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.